This is Martin Algren, Director of Photography on The Plot Against America, and you're uh, watching or listening to The Go Creative Show. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Consoli. I'm a director and owner of BC Media Productions. And this is The Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. Now today we're speaking with Martin Algren. He's the director of photography for The Plot Against America, which is such a great show. It's on HBO. It's such a good show, and it looks amazing. And we talk a lot about how we achieved that look. Now, there's some differences here that you'll see on The Plot Against America that you don't see on a lot of, a lot of other shows. First of all, Martin is using deep focus on this show. Almost everything is in focus all the time, and uh, it creates this really interesting look, and it's inspired by the photojournalism kind of uh, golden age of the 1930s. So we talk a lot about how he sort of interpreted that, made it his own, added some modern twists to it, because he basically in this show is creating an alternate history. So it has to feel like something that has actually happened with that same authenticity, but give you a little twist on it. And uh, Martin does a really good job of doing this. So for all of you guys that haven't really done a lot of deep focus cinematography, this is an episode not to miss. Uh, he shot on the Sony Venice, and we talked about kind of how he came to that conclusion. There's a lot of information there as well about how he lights for deep focus and the lenses he chooses to achieve that look. So all of you cinematography geeks out there, you will love this episode. So I'm here with Martin Algren. He is the director of photography for The Plot Against America. And this is your third time on Go Creative Show, I think, Martin. So welcome back again. You just you just can't stay away, can you? <laughs> well, thank you for having me again. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Well, you were on originally for House of Cards, one of our most popular episodes, and you came back on for Altered Carbon. I mean, the cinematography in both those shows is just stunning. And we're not going to be talking about those today because... There's so much to talk about with The Plot Against America and um, can't wait to dive in because it has such a unique look. Uh, the message is interesting. It's timely. I mean, this is such a great show. Can you tell us about the show? Just give us a little synopsis of uh, The Plot Against America. Well, it's a um, uh, sort of like an alternate history, uh, which... Uh, uh, obviously, is uh, something that we've seen before. This one stays fairly true to actual history. Uh, it imagines uh, the uh, 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 Roosevelt losing the uh, 1940 election uh, to Charles Lindbergh, uh, and uh, and sort of like the trajectory that the country takes uh, from that point on. Um, uh, Charles Lindbergh was uh, uh, an America firster and. And um, uh, you know had ties to uh, Nazi Germany in, in some ways, and uh, and the show imagines the uh, the country sort of taking a turn uh, towards fascism and uh, kind of like an isolationist approach uh, for America during World War II, uh, where he campaigns on the promise of keeping America out of the World War. So mm. uh, so the intention was always to uh, to do something that felt. Very historically accurate, but uh, but with this twist of history to sort of look at uh, a what if, basically, uh, if uh, things had been different, what would that have, have meant? And uh, and this is all based on uh, the book by Philip Roth. Something that was really interesting about the show when I'm watching it is because you've seen this kind of idea before, having a different interpretation of history. And what if something else happened? Uh, Man in the High Castle is a good example of that. Um, and we've covered that on the show and the cinematography is great. I love the show, but I think you always know that what you're watching didn't happen when you watch the plot against America. It's, it's so realistic that you're sort of like, you, you kind of forget the fact that you're watching something that is fiction. Absolutely. I mean, I've, e I've even had, uh, a couple of people reach out to me you know, to congratulate me on the show uh, and and be like, yeah, it's really crazy that it uh, or that that happened and that that's all in the past now. And you're like, well, <laughs> not exactly like that, but yes. 
<laughs> You're recreating history, Martin. What are you yeah. doing to us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the show takes place in the 40s, the 1940s. And, you know, with that, you know, you're among now you know, tens and tens and hundreds, really, of cinematographers that have to, that have had to depict this time period. How do you do it in a unique way? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely uh, one thing to consider when I uh, uh, decided to come on the project, uh, because, you know, with, as with anything, you want to be able to, to do something that feels like a creative challenge and that you uh, perhaps can push yourself into doing something that you haven't done before and maybe that you haven't necessarily seen exactly like that before. Um, so, um, uh, Minky, the first director, she had, she had done sort of like a proposal for how she saw the show, which was, which was very good and, and sort of like set the tone for what she imagined. Uh, and then I came on and, uh, and, and since we knew each other and had a lot of trust in each other, uh, sort of built on that and, and expanded on it, uh, primarily in the, in the visual, uh, on the visual side. So, um, what was inspiring you for the visuals of the show? I mean, a lot of what inspired me was going back to photography from that time. And, uh, and a lot of that is uh, sort of like what we call the golden age of photojournalism, which was the 30s, 40s and into the 50s. And, and kind of what became uh, a lot of those photographers sort of like forming uh, Magnum, uh, the photo agency after that. And um, uh, so, so I looked a lot at those, those photographers and, and those photos and uh, and there was a lot of things that I found really good about it. It was sort of like it was the uh, the photo stories of uh, of Life magazine and that and that kind of thing. And um, uh, there was you know strong compositions, uh, emotionally told, usually uh, uh, using natural light, but in a very dramatic way. Um, and um, you know one thing that I that I sort of caught on to that I that I sort of gravitated towards it. And I don't think that it's something that it's particularly known for. But but what I felt was this use of of kind of deeper focus uh, in a in a way that uh, uh, I feel like uh, even photojournalism today and and photo and cinematography specific specifically kind of has this like romance with uh, with shallow focus and has had it for a long time and and in, and, and a lot of the compositions in these uh, photos were so strong because of the deeper focus and because there was focus on a, on a plane in the foreground on something going on in the background at the same time. Uh, so that became kind of a, 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 a main theme that I decided to pursue, the, this deep focus approach. And I, I think it's a really great choice. And something that is interesting about deep focus is you have so much in focus and you are relying on your audience to follow the story that you kind of want them to follow. Like you're trusting your audience in a way that you don't need to trust them so much when things are shallow. You can really direct them when things are shallow. But when the focus is deep, you're relying on the audience to absorb the information you need to give them. And I can only imagine there are certain accommodations that need to be made in order to have that happen. Like, are you thinking about shots lasting longer? Are you thinking about a slower paced edit? Are those some of the things you need to consider when most of or, and, or all of the frame is in focus? Definitely. I mean, I think uh, for sure it, it, it allows... Uh, an image to hold for longer and and for you to sort of scan it and find different points of interest uh, uh, and um, uh, I, I think that's that's definitely a, a part of it. I mean, obviously, it also puts uh, a lot uh, a lot more stress on on several departments to kind of make this this function, especially when you're doing the 1940s and you shoot mainly on location. Um, uh, the 40s is far enough back in time that there's there's not a lot you have for free even when you find uh somewhat period accurate streets it's it's still sure. there's still a tremendous amount of dressing that needs to be done and uh, and, a tr and and extensions with uh, visual effects and this all all obviously become uh, a lot more um uh detail uh oriented when you're also doing deep focus so everything in the background is going to be in focus uh, and uh, and it sort of puts puts pressure on that to be Good. So everyone kind of has to be on board with it, for sure. I want to talk about how you achieved this particular deep focus look, um, because it's a lot more than just, you know, 
shooting with <laughs> deeper focus and, uh, and, you know, closing up your aperture a little bit. There's a lot more to it and a bigger strategy behind it. Um, and I'd love to kind of start with this idea in something that you wrote, you, you were gracious enough to send me your notes as you were kind of creating your lookbook for the show. And I was able to kind of look at all the inspiration and how you pulled together the look of the series. And it's, it was really interesting to see. And you mentioned something in there. You said, I believe the best way to create this 1940s on film is to do so without sentimentality. And I'd like to talk to you about the idea of representing a period piece, but not doing it in a sentimental way. What did you mean by that? Well, I think, I think it's, um, it, it should feel just as present as if it was, uh, something that was taking place in, in present time. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I think it's easy to to kind of get a little bit sentimental when you're doing something that takes place in the past. Uh, both, I mean, uh, you know, my area obviously is the visual visual side, so uh, there is there is maybe something where uh, you know there can be kind of like uh, a certain elegance or classicism or something like that that you're trying to impart on the images because of the period piece, and 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 that can all help establish that but at the same time i i think that uh you know the show is i mean blatantly commenting on the present basically and and i think that uh uh it, it was important that it felt uh relevant and um and 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 sort of like uh the the parallel actions between what's happening in the show in the 1940s and and the events that are happening at the same time in our uh present time you know that there's that there's a correlation that there's not too much of a veneer in between them. So, uh, so it's a, it's it's an abstract kind of idea of not making it too sentimental. But I think our 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 idea from from uh, you know uh, directing art department and photography was to not be sentimental about things and just do it very kind of like uh, 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 present and and straightforward in a way. So the look of the show inspired by photojournalism of like the 30s, 40s, 50s. Um, in a previous article I read, you inspired by uh, Margaret Brooke White, Helen Levitt, and Robert Frank. We'll put a link to some of their work in the show notes so you guys can see what we're talking about here. Um, so in creating that look, you've sort of found this deep focus idea. How do you achieve that from a camera standpoint? Like where, where did it start? Well, so I knew... That was one of the main things I was looking for. So when I started testing cameras, I specifically set out to uh, see which camera would give me the, uh, uh, the the deepest focus with the best visual result. Uh, you know, because uh, uh, you know you could boost your ISO all the way to to be able to stop down, for instance. But different cameras are going to fall apart at different different rates and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, you know, in, in addition to the aperture being uh, a, a main deciding factor of how how much depth of field you have, the other one is um, uh, how small your uh, your image area is that you're you're uh, recording the image onto. So, by actually choosing a camera with a smaller sensor, uh, that immediately gives you a deeper focus as well. So, so there were a few different uh, 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 factors to consider, and I did sort of like a five camera shootout. Uh, where we tested the five cameras that we thought had real potential to be the ones. Um, and uh, and we sort of set up scenarios, different lighting scenarios, push the cameras, you know, all the things that you do when you test shoot with just, just a bare light bulb, shoot with uh, candlelight, shoot, uh, shoot with uh, bright sunlight uh, shining, shining in through a window, and like all these kind of like different extreme scenarios to sort of, sort of see, push the cameras as much as possible. And at the same time, setting all five cameras in settings so that their depth of field was the same on all five cameras, whether it was achieved by, you know, one having a smaller sensor, but like uh, a, a, a larger aperture, another one having a, a larger sensor, but a smaller aperture to, to match the, uh, the, same, the same focus. So that's, that's how we went about doing it. Uh, and the camera we landed on was the, uh, the Sony Venice. Hmm. Ultimately, how did you come to that decision? What what was the right combination of you know aperture versus uh, lensing versus like, how, how did you get to that and why the Venice? Well, I mean, so the Venice had two things that are that are good. It has uh, pretty tight uh, pixel spacing, uh, meaning that the distance between each pixel is pretty small, 
uh, you know, the Alexa is known for having quite wide pixel spacing, and and a lot of people feel like that's uh, part of its benefit in terms of uh, how it uh, deals with uh, with the image. But but it also means that uh, in order to get a certain resolution, you have to have a certain size uh, chip as well. So that's kind of working against it when you're going for for deeper focus. So on the Venice, uh, we actually ended up um, windowing in the sensor. Uh, because there's there's no sort of like a, like a lot of the other networks that I work with lately that have a 4K mandate. There's no such mandate with HBO. Um, but so we windowed it into 3K, which felt like a very uh, uh, acceptable image when we when we studied it and broke it apart with lighting and that kind of thing. Um, and that made uh, the sensor only 18 millimeters across, uh, which is sort of like right in between Super 16 and Super 35. Super 16 is 12 millimeters wide and Super 35 is uh, uh, 24.5 or something like that millimeters. So, so we're kind of right in between that. Um, so, so that was a pretty good place uh, in terms of the sensor size. And then in addition, the camera has the uh, expanded um, or the dual base ISO uh, where you have a, a native ISO of 2500, uh, which is, is pretty, uh, uh, pretty remarkable and, uh, uh, and yeah. to have at that quality and, um, uh, and allows you to stop down even when you're lighting in lower, lower light situation. What stop were you shooting at? For the most part, I mean, I'm sure each scene is a little different, but yeah, I mean, if we were sh- we were almost never using ND. I mean, one thing with that camera that's that's really quite quite good uh, from a from a shooting standpoint is that it has these internal NDs that uh, that are quick to punch in, and you can change stop by stop. Uh, we almost very rarely used NDs, uh, and we would stop down uh, almost all the way when we were outside. You 16, 16 and a half. Um, in combination with the 3K. Sometimes if we felt that um, we had enough focus for everything we needed, we would st- we would just switch to 4K in those situations. But uh, And then indoors, it, it would matter. I mean, we would um, not necessarily aim for a certain, uh, certain stop. Uh, and I wanted to have a very modern lighting approach, meaning I was lighting it with practicals. I was lighting through windows. Uh, I wasn't uh, like blasting the set with light. Um, so... You know, our for instance, our our set that we built, which is the family's apartment. I think we were shooting around a four and a third or something like that in there. So not not super deep, but uh, but still perhaps deeper than I would have done uh, in many other situations. I mean, the last few things I've done have been large format and wide open, so it's been extremely shallow focus instead. So this was very different. You really don't hear that much about people shooting with this deep focus nowadays. It just doesn't yeah. seem to come up very much. Maybe for a good reason. Um, <laughs> well, were there any l- issues that you came across that well, you were kind of like, oh man, why did we decide to do this? <laughs> well, I, l- I learned after a while to not be too strict about it because if you were truly shooting an interior location that was with pretty flat walls and, and a set that just didn't have so much depth to offer, uh, it didn't buy you very much to be focused on the uh, metal hinges on the door frame behind the actor, that kind of thing. So in those situations, I would I would actually open up a little bit more and and uh, uh, and not not go for the deepest focus possible. And you know, and we also had this kind of, and it's only used a few times over the whole uh, the whole show, but uh, where we go to extremely shallow focus, we we take advantage of the of the large format six K on the camera. And um, mm. shoot wide open. Uh, or we had we had a few large format lenses, and um, so for some really subjective moments with uh, with certain characters. Uh, so which really stands out when the rest of the show is uh, is, is deep focus uh, in a way. Uh, but you know, anytime we did a scene like that, the operators would just go like, "Oh, why don't we sh- shoot like this all the time?" This is, <laughs> and I would be like, "Well, I mean, anyone can make shallow focus look good," you know. <laughs> Did you get any pushback at all with this decision from either the network or the crew or directors? Uh, initially, I had uh, a little bit of pushback uh, from visual effects. Um, uh, I don't think from art department necessarily. They usually like to see their sets. Um, but uh, visual effects was definitely concerned a little bit. Uh, but uh, once everyone was on board, I think that they were also digging it and getting into uh, getting into the look and they did a they did a tremendous job it's a very i think if uh, if you um, if you see it in uh, uh, 
uh, in lar- on a large screen. It's uh, they've done a tremendous job uh, finishing the uh, finishing the backgrounds and and sort of like creating this world that uh, uh, that I think feels uh, very authentically uh, real. Talk to me about the lenses that were selected to pair with that Sony Venice. We we kind of felt like having vintage lenses would would sort of add another veneer uh, to, um, uh, you know, help with uh, with the look. You know, like it can, there's some nice effects that can be had uh, with with uh, more vintage lenses. But uh, a lot of times when you stop down as much as we do, uh, those lenses they kind of start to converge and they all look the same because usually a lot of the the things that we like about um, uh, older glass is uh, sort of uh, most prominent when you're shooting wide open or close to it. Uh, but uh, we we ended up on the Kawa uh, spherical uh, lenses. Uh, so, um, which uh, and one thing that was nice with them was, uh, and and it's something that I like uh, when a lens does, is that it uh, it had a real um, uh, uh, contrast change in highlights. So it would it would sort of like reduce the contrast around bright windows or bright light sources and that kind of thing. And that didn't change when you stopped down. So you had that uh, all the way down, deeper stops. So that was the reason going for that. Um, now, those lenses um, tend to have a lot of internal like ghosting effects, which I sometimes can find quite disturbing, like when if you have candles in a scene and you see reflections of those candles in other areas of the of the image, um, or, or street lights and that kind of thing. So if we had scenes at night where we um, uh, had a lot of street lights or we had a lot of like pingy kind of uh, light sources, uh, we would use uh, a set of uh, Cook fives, uh, and so it's more modern lenses to kind of uh, not deal with that problem. Uh, so they're, they're very fast, and that came in handy a couple of times. But most of the time, we we were shooting our night scenes that stops deeper than than we needed for for those lenses. But but the fact that they handled the um, the light sources in frame a little bit better was helpful. I think a lot of people, myself included, don't really even know what their lenses look like stopped down that far. Yeah, because you just never do it. So you there's probably so much that was revealed in camera testing where you're like, "Ooh, this looks great," yeah. but then as you stop down, you're like, "Ugh, this isn't working." <laughs> yeah, and the lenses are not always great when they get to like an eleven and a, and a sixteen. You know, they they do start to fall apart on that end as well. Uh, but uh, it's. Uh, uh, but we don't mind that so much when we do it on the wide open end always. So uh, I, yeah. I think it was, well, it worked for us. Did you ever go into 6K? Yeah, so we did do that for some of those like shallow focus uh, moments of uh, where we decided to uh, make a scene very subjectively from someone's point of view. Uh, mm. So there's there's a few scenes like that. Were you able to use your primes for the 6K sensor or did you have to change lenses for that? Yeah, the the... The primes, which are uh, the Kawa for, primes, yeah, yeah, exactly. The Kawas who are, are sort of you can you can use them when they you get to the longer end because uh, the uh, image circle will will start to, uh, to cover the whole sensor at that point. But uh, we we carried a few uh, Canon Cine primes that uh, that we had for uh, uh, for that specifically. So mm. uh, so very fast lenses like one point three and one point five. Now, I can only assume you're using a lot of wide angles to support this kind of, you know, deep focus look. Um, can you give us some insight on the the focal lengths or the lenses you use for the most part? Yeah, I mean, I would say our uh, one of our hero lenses was probably a 20 millimeter. Um, mm. uh, so, and, uh, you know, including, so 20, 25, those two lenses were definitely used uh, a lot. Uh, but we also, you know, one thing that's kind of interesting with deep focus is when you do it on a longer lens, uh, because it's it's kind of an unusual effect when you're on a 75 yeah. and you're at a T16 or something like that, because uh, you you sort of expect that kind of compression to have a certain amount of out of focus. Like, even if you're not a photographer, you just like from having seen photography, you kind of have a certain idea of what the optics uh, look like. Uh, so we did like a few. Uh, uh, we li- we did like using some longer lenses with uh, deeper focus as well. Yeah, because I'm trying to think of a situation where I-, I feel like if I'm going to use a longer lens, I'm going to do it 
specifically because I want narrow depth of field. Like I, having that deep focus on a longer lens, it's kind of an interesting, it's sort of an interesting paradox where I don't think it's being used that often in that effect. Where Like when you were doing that, did you find situations you'd set things up, art department, framing everybody, and then all of a sudden you look through and you're like, oh, wait a minute, the compression is way off. It's not what I thought it was going to be and had to make adjustments to well, suit. Um, yeah, I mean, but I, I also, we also ended up liking it a lot. I mean, with um, uh, Minky, who directed the first three episodes, she loves doing overs and sort of like connecting the people visually in the same frame. Um, mm-hmm. And one thing that's interesting when you're doing overs with deeper focus is that the person in the foreground, the temple of that person is now kind of in focus as well. Uh, yeah. and, and if you and if you play with that, if you have like head turns and things like that, uh, there's interesting things that can happen when you're when you're actually uh, seeing seeing expressions on that person. I mean, we would also do extremer situations. Where we would kind of do like the 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 really hanging over the temple, sort of like the 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 movie Insider uh, sort of made that that popular with the where the lens like really hangs over the side of someone's face. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. So, so there was interesting things to do, and, and we kind of like doing very heavy overs where the the foreground takes up a big part of the frame and uh, and and things like that, and um, uh, and and we also found that we liked um, in some situations if we had a group of people to really fill the frame with faces. So by using a longer lens, you could sort of like uh, get a, get a find an angle where say if there were four or five faces. Uh, where you could kind of get them to almost fill the entire area of the image. Um, and with the deeper focus, you could hold most of them in focus as well. And it sort of becomes like a, uh, an interesting interesting look because especially with that longer lens and and um, and Reiki over faces, you expect it to just be one person in focus in a way. So it was it was quite fun to kind of use it and 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 be able to hold more in those. Let's talk about your lighting techniques for the plot against America. It takes takes place in the 1940s. Not a lot of options. You don't have RGB LEDs all over the place. You've got daylight. You've got tungsten. <laughs> that's that's what you have. Yeah. Um, and you also did a lot of interesting things with color palette and you know certainly costume design and production design to give it that look. But talk to me about your lighting philosophy, your lighting choices to achieve this. 1940s that you've created. I, I I didn't have a strict rule that we can only use tungsten. We use plenty of uh, LED lights. We, uh, you know, the the only guiding kind of principle was that it should look like um, uh, it should look natural. It should. Uh, uh, we didn't want it to look stylized. We wanted it to be dramatic, and uh, uh, and um, uh, and we wanted the lighting to help. Uh, convey emotion and tell the story and that kind of thing. But we wanted to do it in a way that looked like it was uh, uh, natural to to the light that's uh, in the scene. Um, mm. You know, I would look for opportunities to try and light a scene with just one practical. And there's several instances when we were able to do that. And I, I love those kind of scenes where you're yeah. sort of like, um, uh, and it becomes very kind of like crucial where that practical is placed. And you're, you're sort of um, working that out and, and blocking with, with the actors, there's like this one more factor. It's like, how how do you work out the blocking in relation to the practical? Or do you move the practical to work with the, with the blocking and that kind of thing? So, uh, or, um, uh, yeah, so, so that was definitely um, uh, the guiding principle. But no, no hard rules about, like, can only be tungsten light or, or that kind of thing. Well, there must have been some hard rules about, you know, utilizing window light as much as possible and what the light would look like in a home that is only lit by either candlelight or, you know, these tungsten practicals. So yeah, for uh, sure. There, there must be something to it. I mean, you don't have large swaths of overhead canisters like we do now. So there's a lot of kind of accommodations that need to be made for that, I'm assuming. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, we, uh, so the, the only set that we really built was the, uh, the apartment. We had a few swing sets as well, but, uh, but the, uh, um, but the main thing is the uh, the apartment that the family lives in, and about maybe twenty percent of the show was shot there. I don't know how many minutes ended up, uh, if it's roughly the same amount of minutes in the in the show, or or maybe it's more because you're perhaps a little more efficient when you're shooting on on stage. Um, yeah. But about twenty percent of the shoot days was on 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 that stage. 
Um, and, um, uh, you know, we built, we built the apartment with hard ceilings, uh, forcing us to light in through windows and, and, and using, using practicals. We certainly used lights on the, on the ground. Like I, I'm, I'm a big fan of the, um, uh, uh, the four by four uh, uh, blanket lights, uh, which is a it's a light that Source Maker in New York makes. Uh, it's basically a, a roll of LED tape that uh, that can either be taped to a wall or put on a frame. But it's a very flat, big light, and you can kind of push it up close mm-hmm. to the edge of the frame. Um, becomes almost sourceless if you're close enough with it because it's uh, so soft and so uh, uh, and and so large in in relation to how flat it is. So 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 that one is really useful. What what were you taping it on? I guess like was it like how did you what, what did you roll it out on? How was the what was the application? Well, I mean, if we if we literally had no space, you could you could tape it to the wall, even bend it around into a corner of a of a of a room or something like that, and then just dial it on the dimmer to where it was either just a bit of fill or 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 potentially adding to the key light or something like that. But uh, uh, but mostly we would have it on on a frame with with an egg crate to kind of focus it a little bit. Uh, and, um, uh, but we would be able to get it into places that you can almost not get anything else of similar kind of size, uh, just because it is so flat. So you were able to kind of play with the, you were able to build a set that felt tight, uh, and still be able to light around it without any issues. Yeah. I mean, we, we more or less built it like a location. We, you know, uh, when you when you build a set, you're always talking about like wild walls and stuff like that. But in reality, uh, on the schedule you have and the kind of flexibility directors want to have with blocking with the actors, stuff like that, you end up shooting it like you're on location in a way with 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 the walls. It's like a few times you you pull out a wall ahead of time and and uh, in order to accommodate a camera move or something like that. But for the most part, it's it's shooting it with with fixed walls with with a hard ceiling. Um, lighting in through the window. So it's not drastically different from if you were shooting this in a real house on location, uh, except there's some uh, some benefits to being in a studio uh, just overall for production and, and, and all, all departments and stuff. Hmm. And seeing outside the window is a big part of it too. I mean, you're on that set. What makes it feel real is that you're able to look outside the window, but you have so much in focus. Um, what What was your outside of the window environment like was it just you know green screen you added later or were there actual like real live scenes going on behind there uh so we actually uh built a a whole facade uh outside the windows uh with um uh there's like a narrow alley uh on the on the practical location uh that we that we shot on so we built a whole facade uh across that alley with windows uh, and actual rooms inside of it. So we would, on some days, we would have extras move around in the windows across the alley. Um, oh, wow. And, uh, you know, it shows up a few times in the show. I, I don't know that it's uh, uh, significantly, we didn't, we never really made a point out of it. So, okay, on some occasion, we went to the, uh, to the, uh, to that other house and shot into our set from it uh, for another angle and, and that kind of thing. But, uh, uh, but, you know, we wanted to, uh, David Simon and 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 uh, his productions they pretty much never shoot on stage they ev- everything is on location uh, they they want to do like they don't want to do any poor man's car work or any they want if you're shooting in a car they want to go in a car and shoot it and which I love and it's like it's all so so the fact that the this was built on a set was kind of like a huge negative in their eyes. That decision had already been made when I came on the show. I think it was so clear that this was something that it was just uh, crazy not to build as a set, but but it was sort of something that was kind of against the nature of their style of filmmaking in a way. Um, and um, we, we worked in several ways to kind of make it connect to the real uh, location as, as much as possible. So uh, so the set would we would finish the outside of the uh, of the set wall so that we could shoot from the outside looking in, connecting it in that way, and and uh, and then we would on the house that stood in for it on location we would dress the the front room so that we could shoot parts parts of scenes on the real location, uh, shooting out through the windows onto the real street. Um, and connect uh, actions on the street to actions inside the front of the of the apartment as well. Uh, so there were a few things like that, and then we did a few situations where someone someone is 
uh, running out of the apartment, we follow them with Steadicam down the stairs and find a visual effects wipe to take that shot over on the location house and then run out into the street and run after that person out onto the street. So it feels like one continuous shot from our studio set onto the uh, location street. Uh, so yeah. as, mu- as much as possible, trying to connect it in that way. I'm glad you brought up the, well, first of all, where did you shoot? Uh, in New, uh, New Jersey uh, for a lot of it, which is where the show takes place. Yeah. Uh, and, and around New York and, uh, and our stages uh, uh, were at uh, Silver Cup in, uh, in New York, in Queens. I'm glad that you mentioned filming in cars. We don't talk that much about it on the show. And I think in a situation like this where I'm hoping, it sounds like, you did it pretty much practically. You didn't do car stuff in studios. Maybe I'm wrong, but talk to me about your approach to car shots. Yeah, I mean, when when I came on, I I more or less assumed that we would have to do some things in in studio with cars because uh, there's quite a few scenes over several pages of dialogue, um, uh, some of them involving uh, the two child actors uh, at night which is very limiting uh, when, when you're shooting because of the hours that you can work with them and especially night hours that you can work with them. Uh, but they were pretty uh, set on it. Um, and, and for the most part, we set did. On, we, set on, set on, set on shoot, Not... shooting, shooting it on location, uh, oh, okay. drive, driving in a car. Um, and, um, and for the most part, we did. Uh, there was, there's the only time we actually took it into the studio was when we had to do a few pickup shots on those kids uh, from when we had been down in in uh, Washington, D.C., shooting a scene, uh, driving at night where we got mo- most of the footage on the night. But then uh, we're still oh, we still owed a few shots with the kids and we shot that on stage uh, 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 with green screen outside the windows. But so so our approach for for shooting uh, the moving car uh, for the most part, and these are also their cars from the 30s, um, you know, since the show takes place in 1940. Uh, yeah. And um, um, they have a tendency to not always work as well as you hope. Uh, and uh, so our, our main uh, our main way of shooting it would be that we would tow the car on a on a camera car that would have a techno crane on uh, on the back of it. Uh, and uh, that way we were able to move the camera around on the outside of the car uh, to quickly find different angles. So we wouldn't necessarily use the techno crane to make big sweeping shots. I mean, there's certainly your camera moves occasionally, but but the main reason was to get all the different camera angles that we needed to get uh, in a in a quick fashion so that you could you could line up on a on a two shot through the back window, uh, shoot it over and over until you have it, and then have the crane reset to a shot on the other side of the car without having to stop and make a new rig and that kind of thing. So so it just was the most expedient way to do to do that, uh, and then for uh, the night uh, daytime stuff, we just let the uh, daylight light the interior of the car, uh, which mm. I th- I think with with uh, the uh, sensitivity of the cameras these days is is actually uh, quite quite fine. It looks the best because it's just the most real. At nighttime, we um, we actually what we did is that uh, we uh, we installed LED strips into the ceiling of the car uh, under the fabric. Uh, so we, we had them installed before they, uh, they put the, uh, the fabric, the ceiling uh, fabric inside the car. And they would be on, uh, you know, eight different circuits so that we could, as we were driving, if we were lining up on that side shot, we could make sure that we turned on the LED strips that were not visible on, uh, on camera. Uh, very quickly by a uh, dimmer board operator that would sit on the camera car as well next to next to me, and um, uh, and that way we and he could dial those eight circuits individually in terms of like the brightness if we wanted the one that's slightly from the back a little bit stronger than the one that's slightly right over the camera for instance, uh, but because they were recessed under the fabric if they were off they were uh, not visible at all. Uh, so when yeah. they were on, they were they were lit, lighting through the fabric, which was pretty heavy. But LED strips are very strong, especially for night work. So so uh, uh, you know, with some testing, we knew that we we were going to have enough light out of them. And and the ones that are in a position, like a lot of times, you see some portion of the ceiling uh, on on camera. That portion of the ceiling, we would just then make sure that that was turned off. Uh, and so that worked pretty well. And 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 on a few occasions, we even. Uh, 
um, you know, when we did do a camera move, we would have the dimmer board operator ride the level so that as the cameras transition from one side into the front, uh, a certain certain ones would fade out as we and and another one would fade on as we uh, as we as we did that move. In the first episode of Plot Against America, I noticed a lot, and I saw it in the second episode too, but more so in the first, a lot of camera motion, a lot of movement, circling around people, like showing off the environment through, you know, it almost seemed like handheld sometimes. Um, can you talk to me about your approach to camera movement in this show, and particularly that first episode, which seems to have the most of it, uh, at least of the, of the episodes that I've seen so far? Well, so when the, when the show starts, it's uh, it's you know pretty uh, times are pretty good. The family is in a in a in a in a good place, and uh, and it's uh, you know we wanted to have a, a, a certain liveliness and and kind of like uh, a spirit to it. So uh, the the camera moves were meant to reflect that to kind of have this mm-hmm. kind of sweeping, uh, flowy kind of like feel where. You know, we're 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 transitioning between things. We're sort of like catching all the action. We wanted it to feel uh, lively and busy and 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 full of activity. So that is sort of meant to kind of like support that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily uh, go away, or not at least intentionally go away, as much as it transitions into something that's a little rougher. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, I would say that our percentage of handheld definitely went up over the episodes and towards like the, the, the last episodes. Um, and, uh, so it sort of goes from being more smooth, kind of like, uh, dance, like if you will, kind of moves into something that's, um, a little, little rougher handheld and, and maybe sometimes counter counter moving with, uh, with the action or doing something that's against what, uh, what the flow of the, uh, physical action in front of the camera would be. Um, actually, another thing that's uh, that we did uh, on that topic in terms of the DI, you know, we had a we had a lot that we had built that was based on a on a film stock uh, fifty two ninety three, um, and, um, and we also had a degree of uh, of uh, ENR, which uh, uh, you know was a, a silver attention process that was used uh, like in the lab to to add contrast and uh, desaturate colors to some extent and. And, um, uh, uh, and, and, and we, that was part of the look that we were using, but we also had it separate from the film lot, uh, so we can dial it separately. And we played a little bit with it on set, but in, in the DI, we found, uh, that for every episode, we would, we would up the ENR percentage by 10 points or something like that. Uh, so mm-hmm. that it goes from being, uh, like a slightly softer look to, uh, towards the end, having more of this harsher, uh, because it adds kind of like a slight uh, harsher quality to the contrast, like the uh, the highlight tend to uh, to to ping a little bit sharper and that kind of thing. So, so that was uh, that was another thing that was adding in, in in terms of with the camera movement becoming harsher, but also the the LUT suddenly suddenly uh, growing a little bit harsher as well. It's called ENR. You're saying, yeah, ENR was a was a lab process. So it was uh, it okay. was something that was that was developed with you know with uh, cinematographers wanting to control contrast in uh, in film printing. So when you say silver retention, that's pertaining to the contrast levels or the contrast ratio. I mean, it's it's pertaining to uh, controlling the amount of silver in the negative on the on the film stock and developing. Uh, sure. so, so it's like, but I guess, you know, how do you represent that digitally is what I, exactly. Mean. So, that- so, it, so it's, it's been created as a, as a lot, as a, as a, as a, an approximation of that effect basically. And it, and it affects, uh, a lot of different things. It actually also s- changes the colors a little bit. So we liked it for, for the effect that it had on, on, on the colors. A lot of times we would, in the DI, we would, before we had turned on the NR setting, we would we would kind of grade the image, and then we would turn on the ENR, and it was sort of like okay, everything was just brought in, brought in uh, to to place with that, with just that color shift that would happen with it as well. Um, mm. So, how important was it for you to have an onset LUT that reflected the show as close as possible? I I think it's pretty important because people get used to it, and uh, it's. Uh, uh, I think it's important for being able to discuss the uh, the image on set, uh, 
uh, and also, you know, for the months of post that's going to be going on between you finishing shooting before you get to the DI, people just being completely um, living with that material uh, for so long. I think it's important that it's at least, you know, tor- towards the direction that you're you're intending. In our case, it actually was uh, very close. We, we we did a lot of testing before we started shooting, and we had landed on the the lots that we liked. Uh, uh, you know, the lenses and we tested the light and types of lighting styles that we were going to use. So we, so it was very close. Ob- obviously there's a lot of finessing to be done in the DI still, but it's, uh, yeah. uh, but it's, uh, the dailies, uh, look, uh, look, uh, very similar. And I mean, when you, when you pull daily still next to DI stills, there's like a refinement to the DIs, but they're, they're very much the same, the same world. In the final episode of the plot against America, episode six, you have a scene that is day for night. How are you filming effective day for night scenes? It, it was sort of made day for night out of necessity to some extent, uh, although um, it wasn't the expectation. I mean, it, the expectation was probably that it was going to be a, a, a lit night scene. Uh, well, what was happening in the scene? It's uh, it's a um, uh, sort of like a radar con- 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 uh, reconnaissance on uh, on the top of a mountain overlooking. Uh, other mountains uh, with a starry sky, and um, there's a scene that goes on there with very little lighting because uh, it's a military operation and they need to stay hidden. Um, and um, in my mind, that kind of scene can't actually be lit uh, in a realistic way. Any any way you do it, it's going to have an artifice of some sort, uh, which is fine. Um, but uh, but just logistically, it's not possible to light the mountain sides on the other. Uh, across the, across the um, uh, uh, along the horizon, um, so day for night to me can play a, a role in that scenario. And um, uh, the way we approached it was um, to uh, light the foreground um, uh, to a certain level, so that we could dial down the background, uh, but leave uh, the sky to be replaced by by post production. Um, so the way, um, and, and I've done this uh, before for, for Day for Night, and, and it, that works the best for me, I think, is that uh, to have a um, sort of like a, a silk or, or a solid topper overhead. Uh, so so we, had a, we had a frame suspended from a, from a construction crane overhead to kill direct sunlight from, uh, from the area that's the foreground of our frame, basically. Uh, so that way you've gotten rid of, of the sunlight being a factor in, um, in the foreground. Uh, and then we would use HMIs through diffusion, like through large frames, to kind of sculpt the light in that area instead. So you can kind of create what yeah, hopefully feels almost like a, kind of like a sourceless uh, uh, environment, but with some, with some contrast and shaping to it. Uh, and then inside of that, there's a few uh, practical tungsten sources in the scene. Uh, but because we're, of course, uh, doing this at, uh, at daytime with daytime levels, our tungsten sources have to be extremely bright. So we would have, uh, you know, um, maxi lights just to the edge of the frame with uh, all power bulbs. So they're like 12 light uh, 1K uh, power lights. Uh, with with all power lights, so we can spot that into an area that needs to be very bright uh, because it's supposed to look like it's lit by a 25 watt tungsten bulb, but it's we have to shoot it in the middle of the day. So, so we would make some some areas extremely bright uh, with tungsten light like that. Um, and for the actor himself, we would sneak into his closer shots. We would lay a, a nine light fay, which is a a, a small nine light with small uh, uh, also again spotlights, but uh, 650 watt in total, um, uh, but very concentrated and very, very bright light that we could do as a glow from the, uh, from the practical that's sitting on the machinery that he's working on, uh, but still make that feel like it's, it's kind of like a low level light, but it needs to be that bright to compete with the, with the daylight. And then it's still on set a matter of convincing the actress and the director that this is going to come together and and look like nighttime because this environment you're shooting in is extremely bright because you're in the middle of the daytime and you're using HMIs to bring it up so that you can dial down your background and you're adding these very bright tungsten sources that sort of 
fighting against your your natural understanding of the world around you as something that's that's dark. And when you see it on the monitor, the sky has not been replaced yet, so it's also a bright sky. Now you had to reveal basically a mountain range in this scene. You simply just wouldn't be able to do that at night. You you wouldn't be able to light it. It would just be pitch black. So, yeah. I mean, it seems like it kind of had to be done this way in order to achieve what you were going for. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I, I remember when the, 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 um, uh, the Sony A7S Mark II, I think when it came out, you know, because it has these ridiculous ISO settings, someone made a yeah. short film that was shot entirely in moonlight. Uh, and it's and I, th- I thought it was brilliant. I mean, that's the exact application for that kind of thing. It's like if you can go out and shoot at fifty thousand ISO, it's pretty amazing that you can then make a movie that's taking place entirely in moonlight. Uh, but that option wasn't quite available for us, at least not at the quality that we wanted to to achieve it at. But uh, yeah, what are some of the mistakes that people made, and that maybe you've made in the past when shooting day for night? Well, I. To, to me, uh, the thing that helps uh, bring it together and sort of is when you have these other sor- sources of light motivating it. I think uh, when there is a bright light source that's artificial somewhere in the frame as a reference so that uh, it doesn't just look like stop down daytime, um, you know, like like which is the convention that we that like when it was first started to be used in, in films. Um uh, where it's just a hard sunlight used backlit uh, and then and then stop down and and that goes a long way but I think like the thing that brings it together is having that that strong that strong light source that's uh, either casting a light on on the people or is is uh, lighting up an, an area brightly in the frame I think that sort of is 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 something that's really helping it what would you say was the most challenging scene or shot of the series, something that maybe we can be watching and looking at as we're listening to you speak. Uh, and how did you overcome that challenge? Well, there's, um, one shot we did where we're rotating around one of the main characters, um, uh, for, for a scene that's, uh, uh, you know, the husband is coming home to the apartment and, um, uh, tells his wife that, uh, there are uh, gangsters patrolling the street outside their house. Uh, the country is more or less uh, on the brink of breaking into martial law. And um, uh, we wanted the camera to sort of like rotate around uh, his wife uh, uh, for that moment and um, and sort of play out the scene as a wonder, basically. Uh, mm. So, so there were a few things to to get around for that, which um, uh, included, you know, being in a situation where they they're surrounded by practicals and mostly lit by practicals, um, and um, and then also uh, having having the camera move uh, in a in a way around that felt interesting, but also added to the tension of it. So, um, the um, the practical situation we sort of we sort of got around. We actually used that uh, LED light. We we taped it to the ceiling, so it was sort of like hanging off the ceiling above above the actress. So she had kind of like this uh, this light that was uh, that was lighting her even when the camera was passing just like within a foot in in front of her. Um, yeah. And then the room, because this is at night, uh, which is full of of small little practicals. Uh, we would uh, we would have the uh, the gaffer and the dimmer board operator write a sequence to to dim out the lights that were behind the camera operator. So it's sort of like the whole room sort of like as the camera made three revolutions in the room, the lighting in the room also made three revolutions in order to make that work. Oh, wow. um, so there was a little bit of practice with that. And then we had to, I think, fight our instincts to make it a, a beautiful circling shot on her that kind of lands beautifully and, uh, uh, and um, is... Uh, uh, very controlled, and uh, you know our A camera operator Stu Cantrell, who operated the Steadicam on that, uh, could certainly achieve that with no problem. Uh, but I think part of the tension that we were looking for was to uh, make it um, uh, sort of like have have the tension heightened during the scene, which to us meant both the camera coming in and and changing the size, uh, but also to kind of like. 
uh, rotate away from her. So we built in some rotations uh, between the two actors. So the, the shot would alternate between being on her and then uh, kind of drifting off and finding her husband and then coming back to her all as it's rotating three times around her. Um, mm. So so it was a physically complicated shot for the, uh, for the operator and also to find the timings uh, for it to work. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, I, I sort of like it because it, 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 the final result sort of feels like the camera almost goes into a free spin where it's random, where it's sort of like hitting, but it's managing to get the dialogue points that we wanted to get, a, get, get across and the movements of between the two actors to kind of like flow in between that. So it, it, it took a little bit of working out, but it was uh, 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 worth it in that sense, I think. The show is called The Plot Against America. It's on HBO right now, all six episodes. Um, nominated for an Emmy for Outstanding Cinematography. How do you feel? Oh, it's, uh, it's great, of course. Uh, very, very happy about it. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really weird because they, the Emmys this year is, um, uh, you know, as I'm sure you uh, would ex- assume, all virtual uh, or all yeah. online. Uh, and they have asked all the nominees to send in uh, an acceptance speech in advance, uh, which is uh, pretty bizarre to uh, have to do uh, uh, record yourself doing an acceptance speech for an award that you have not gotten. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be hilarious for all of the ones that haven't won yeah. to release their acceptance speeches. <laughs> I know. I'm sure there is some sensitivity around that. <laughs> Well, good luck. I mean, you certainly are uh, among many other really, really great cinematographers, but, um, you know, The Plot Against America looks so good. It's an excellent show. I highly suggest you guys check it out, and it's all available right now on HBO. Martin Algren, thank you so much for coming back on Go Creative Show to tell us about it. Thank you, Ben. It's always a pleasure. All right, I want to thank Martin Algren for coming on the show and sharing his experiences shooting The Plot Against America. I hope you guys learned a lot. And if you did and you want to give us some feedback, please do. You can find us on all social media there, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and of course, subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app. I want to thank Matt Russell for mixing and mastering and making the show sound so good. You can find him at gainstructure.com and on Twitter at gainstructure. And of course, our producer, Connor Crosby, over there at ignitionvisuals.com and on Twitter at ignitionvisuals. You can also follow me on Instagram and Twitter at Ben Consoli. I post a lot of behind the scenes of our shoots and everything going on with BC Media Production. And there's been a lot lately between virtual and in-person kind of traditional shooting. So if you like that kind of behind the scenes stuff, and obviously you do because you're listening to Go Creative Show, follow me on Instagram and Twitter and you will see all the stuff that we're working on and how we're creating our stuff. And I know you guys will like that too. Of course, all things Go Creative Show at gocreativeshow.com. Links to everything we talked about today and all previous episodes is there at gocreativeshow.com. And of course, our sponsors, MZ and Post Lab. Without these people, the show wouldn't exist. So please support those that support us. And we will see you next week on another episode of Go Creative Show, a podcast for filmmakers. <laughs>